Yoga, The Eight Steps to Health and Peace, and many other books can be found at archive.org as well. You can read and listen to books on archive. Many books are available for free. Um, this one in particular you have to check out, and I think they limit it to an hour. Um, so you're welcome to do that. Uh, the Eight Steps to Health and Peace. Complete instruction in yoga exercises, breathing, philosophy, nutrition, and meditation by Richard Hittleman. Dedication to self that desires and requires nothing but to which, nonetheless, all things are knowingly or unknowingly dedicated. Chapter 1, Desire Action, The Illusion of Fulfillment. Section 1, The Great Conspiracy. We see ourselves as that which we are not and that which we are, we fail to recognize. Richard Hittleman. It has always seemed to me that the most astonishing information that can be conveyed to a human being in this life is that the fulfillment of all his hopes and desires lies within himself and only within himself. Although understanding this, a person has comprehended all the truth there is, and although this truth can be stated as I have above in the most simple and direct manner, the very large majority of people is prone to dismiss this extraordinary pronouncement almost immediately upon hearing or reading it. And even among those who may recognize that there is something of the greatest significance in a statement such as, the kingdom of heaven lies within, most find that a peculiar forgetfulness of this significance occurs and that long periods of time can elapse before they give it the attention it warrants. In short, the majority of mankind reacts to the startling precept. You will find what you are seeking only within yourself, as though it had little, if any, relevance to itself. What a remarkable situation. Throughout his lifetime, a man strives with all of his being, engaging in a never-ending series of the most trying, exasperating, tedious, and frequently outlandish activities in the hope of realizing at least partial happiness, peace, and fulfillment, objectives in which he is continually frustrated and yet when he is informed that this realization lies closer to him than his eyes or his heart, he generally disregards such information or is inclined to forget it within a matter of moments. If the media were to promote the idea that fulfillment in life could be achieved by journeying to some remote region of the Arctic, think of the multitude who would clog the routes readily enduring whatever hardships and dangers are inherent in such a journey. And yet, although numerous highly reliable resources have since time immemorial pointed to that place where all of men's problems are resolved without taking a single step and without the frantic, often absurd strivings in which they are continually engaged such incredible information falls upon the deaf ears of a very high percentage of, the, of those whom it is conveyed. Two men sit side by side and are instructed by a master. To find peace, he states, look within and find yourself. The first man, in a way that we shall understand later, has an immediate realization of the significance of this instruction. He undertakes to reflect upon and apply in certain prescribed procedures what he has been told. In due course, this practice results in his enlightenment and subsequent liberation. He becomes free from suffering and is at peace. 
For the second man, this instruction has no real meaning. He hears the identical words as the first man, but is unable to comprehend them because they pertain to a dimension of existence with which he has no conscious contact. His rational reasoning mind, to which he submits all data, has no frame of reference for the illogical input. It cannot conceive of where within is to be located or how it shall find a self other than the one that it believes it knows perfectly well. Consequently, perhaps immediately, perhaps after some little consideration, the words of the master are dismissed as irrelevant. It is in this sense that the second man is deaf and that he does not have ears to hear. Spiritual knowledge, esoteric doctrines, metaphysical principles, occult secrets can all be revealed in his presence. To him they are meaningless, even nonsensical, because he has no direct awareness of that dimension from where they originate and to which they pertain. So, although this man's existence in what he knows as the world is in actuality totally sustained through another dimension, the within, this other dimension remains strangely obscured, hidden from him. The great riddle therefore becomes, how is it that a man can be ignorant of that which is the source of his life and be unaware of the one and only reality of his, his existence? The self. This riddle has formed the nucleus from which the most profound schools of Oriental philosophy have evolved. In these philosophies, one frequently encounters the Sanskrit term Maya, a fascinating word that is used to describe the state of consciousness in which the deaf man functions. It is a state of illusion and forgetfulness, a type of hypnosis. That is, a man forgetting his true nature, his real identity, forgetting who he is, identifies himself with a body and a mind and attaches himself to the objects and conditions that his mind interprets as the world. He then attempts to possess, manipulate, and function among these objects and conditions in a way that he believes will result in his happiness and fulfillment. This assumption constitutes man's fall and is responsible for all of his subsequent difficulties, which in Oriental philosophies are described as sufferings. To put it another way, in the state of Maya, I am fully convinced that my body and elements that I refer to as my mind comprise myself I may also admit to a soul, but even if I regard myself as religious, this is the vaguest of intangibles and plays a meaningful part in my life, if at all, on only the rarest occasions. Once the image of self, the I, the ego, is firmly established in my consciousness, I am indeed an individual. I see and feel myself as being different, separate, apart from all of the other selves that surround me. I now find myself to be comprised of a body, senses, emotions, and a mind, and these quickly infuse in me the concept of threat. That is, they advise me that myself is subject to a very broad spectrum of undesirable experiences ranging from minor discomforts to total extinction. As a consequence, I am made to understand that the business of my life will be not only to protect myself from whatever may threaten it physically, but from everything that would diminish any aspect of it and make it appear as less than it wishes to be. It demands protection from every type of mental and emotional pain and adversity. Simultaneously, I must increase myself, build it, develop it, inflate it, aggrandize it, make it real and permanent, and provide it with security in all situations. Once accepting this, I can no longer distinguish between the true, real, non-fragmented self of my original state and those attributes of body, mind, senses, and emotions which com comprise myself. 
I identify totally with the latter and the self becomes myself. Now I exist in the state of Maya. Here I have no conscious knowledge of the progression of events of the fall described in the preceding paragraphs. Now nothing is of greater importance than myself, no matter how altruistic the role in which it is cast. I become wholly immersed in Mayic activities, seeking the protection and aggrandizement of myself. I contrive endlessly to experience success without failure, pleasure without pain, happiness without despair, love without complications. I engage in those activities which my reasoning, rational, logical mind and my emotions and senses have informed me will accomplish these ends. In my state of Maya, I fail to understand that the selves I see all about me are also in this state of illusion and that the activities with which they are involved, those which their senses, emotions and reasoning minds have directed them to engage in cannot lead to the realization of the desired goals any more than can my own. The fact that I and those around me never seem to achieve our objectives in the ultimate sense that we find human dissatisfaction and unrest whenever we turn doesn't shake our collective confidence that we are nonetheless on the right path. That is the fact that whatever fulfillment we appear to experience is inevitably followed by the need for additional fulfillment or that the peace we gain is soon disturbed by one or another event. We attribute to the inadequacy of our actions. We continue to convince one another through the emperor's new clothes syndrome, through the most remarkable universal conspiracy, that sooner or later, individually or collectively, we shall hit upon the correct pattern of actions and our objectives will be achieved. And so we press on, we will endeavor to impose peace upon the world, get the poor off welfare, sweep out the old guard, run the hippies out of town, nationalize the oil industry, attend the proper group therapy sessions, fall in love with the right person, raise a family, travel to exotic lands, get the, the job promotion, drop out and join the movement to legalize marijuana, buy a sleek foreign car and discover the ultimate deodorant. Then we shall surely at last be fulfilled. Let us therefore dismiss our eons of previous failures and pursue the right course of action, which will this time bring about the desired ends. The continuing call of my fellow conspirators is for action. I agree. I fully accept the proposition that action is necessary to satisfy desire. And I learn that particular actions are necessary to satisfy particular desires. I may on occasion examine the type of desire and the type of action, but I never question the validity of desire and action themselves. If I read that in a serious discussion of man's activities, no value distinction is made between a questionable enterprise such as the search for the ultimate deodorant and a highly noble endeavor as the cultivation of world peace. I may grow indignant. There is a most crucial point to be made here. My indignation is an overt reaction to myself, the ego. It righteously asserts that some activities are inherently more meritorious than others. The collective ego is the, of the conspirators advances this concept in the guise of promoting human dignity and conscience. By doing so, it lends validity to a value scale of activities. This is the very trap that ensnares the self in the belief that action can result in fulfillment and that different types of action result in different types of fulfillment. The startling truth is that no activity is more meaningful than another in affecting my true fulfillment. No matter how sincere the resolve, no matter how ardent the pursuit, 
no matter how apparent the success in bringing it to a satisfactory conclusion, no matter how frequent the change from one mode of action to another, I have no difficulty in understanding this as it pertains to certain basic physical desire action patterns. If I am thirsty, I drink. If I am tired, I sleep. Neither is more important than the other. And although each of these desires has been fully satisfied, I certainly do not equate this satisfaction with permanent fulfillment. I know that I shall soon thirst and tire again, but in the meantime, having temporarily satisfied these basic desires, I can get on with the real business of life of satisfying my more important, more significant desires. So although I know without doubt that I shall thirst and drink, tire and sleep throughout my lifetime, my perspective in the state of Maya is circumscribed to the extent that I seem incapable of applying this vital knowledge to what I have conceived of as the really important business of my life. I fail to apprehend the process of continually alternating opposites. There is a never ending cycle of pleasure and pain, happiness and despair, success and failure. The time will never come when I have finally through my persistence, hard work, ingenuity and good luck beaten the game. In my hypnotic condition, I accept the party line and learn to conceive of pleasure apart from pain, happiness apart from despair, and success apart from failure. I then contrive with every resource at my command to experience one without the other, to, in the words of the popular song, accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. What a hopeless endeavor. I do not discern that pleasure and pain are inherent in one another, that they are two ends of the same stick, that I cannot hold one without simultaneously holding the other. If I do achieve happiness, I shall certainly experience a corresponding degree of misery, for one is as certain to evolve from the other as day turns to night. In the state of Maya, I am continually diverted by my fellow conspirators and my own rational mind from confronting the truth that would transform my existence. Pleasure and pain are one. Success will certainly alternate with failure. It is only a question of time until my present hard-won peace of mind degenerates into new turmoil, forcing me into a whole further series of activities in an attempt to regain tranquility. Once this fundamental law of con continually alternating opposites penetrated my consciousness, I would perceive that it covers the entire range of human endeavors and that failure to quench my thirst for permanent security, permanent peace, permanent fulfillment is due not to my inadequate or incorrect action, but is the result of my belief that action as I know it can culminate in anything that is permanent and fulfilling. Questioning the value of action, mind you, not the type of activities in which I am involved and whether they are noble or base, but the whole conception of action itself, I would be led to examine the phenomenon of desire, for I would discover quite naturally that it is desire that engenders action. Put in the most simple possible terms, the pattern is this. I want such and such, and therefore I must do such and such to have it. This is so basic, so axiomatic, that our life can generally be described entirely in terms of the desire action pattern. I am taught to determine on a minute to minute, as well as on a lifelong basis, what it is I need and want, and to implement the actions that will satisfy these desires. This process has become so natural that without rebellion, I accept it. I even encourage the experience of a never ending series of desires that must be translated into a never ending series of corresponding actions. After all, if some or most of my desires are not satisfied, there is hardly a single fellow conspirator 
who is not delighted to provide me with an almost infinite number of alternate courses of action or suggest how I may exchange my impossible fantasy desires for more realistic ones. However, if as stated above, the futility of the actions with which I have been continually involved were to become apparent to me through my understanding of the law of continually alternating opposites, and this led to an examination of desire again, not the relative merit of one desire as opposed to another, but the whole conception of desire itself, I would indeed open a Pandora's box. I would be forced to reflect upon the nature of desires. Where do they come from? Why do they endlessly succeed one another? Why, when I appear to have satisfied a long-standing desire of major consequence, is my sense of fulfillment so short-lived? Are desires, as I have always believed, natural? What if I am never able to satisfy my strongest desires? This line of questioning, if pursued in depth, would cast desire in a completely different and extremely significant light. I would have to reevaluate the role that desire plays in my existence, and I would gain an insight into the desire-action relationship that could lead to a highly disturbing conclusion. Desire engenders action, but the action that I undertake to satisfy the desire not only frequently necessitates a whole group of attendant actions, but tends to generate a multitude of new desires. This cycle, which in the innermost depths of my being I would detect is responsible for a continual frustration, a ground base of suffering, is obviously an eternal one. That is, if desires which arise from an unknown source and which I seem helpless to prevent, require actions that ultimately prove fruitless in providing the permanent peace, security, and fulfillment that I seek, and if my very involvement in these actions can generate a series of new desires for which I must undertake a corresponding series of new actions, at what point will this process terminate? When and where shall I cease to suffer and at last find peace? My reasoning, rational, logical mind can only respond with never, and if myself were able to view the situation from an even more profound vantage point, it would add, not in death, but which is an extension of life and not in an infinite number of succeeding lifetimes and death times, the cycle is eternal. Desires and the still to manifest effects of their corresponding actions, karma, do not evaporate into nothingness at the time of death. The physical body dissolves, but desires are unfinished business. They remain in a subtle seed form awaiting another vehicle for subsequent expression and potential fulfillment. As with all desire, action eventually ensues. Here, action results in what is known as reincarnation. A new body provides the needed vehicle. It is the desire that incarnates. The body is born into the physical world with the seed of previous desires contained therein. What do you mean I didn't ask to be born? Of course you did, because desires are infinite and thus cannot be satisfied during any lifetime of a physical body the lifetimes themselves become infinite. And even when the universe is withdrawn and temporarily sleeps, that is, when it is in its night, its potential rather than manifest state, the seeds of desire of the individual selves remain with it also sleeping, also potential. When an astronomical period of time has elapsed and the universe once again manifests, on all of its planes when it is once again in its day period. The desire seeds manifest with it and each individual self takes on another endless series of bodies to nurture these seeds. This day-night cycle of creation is likewise eternal. But the resourcefulness of all of my fellow selves in maintaining the desire action fulfillment illusion in diverting me from examining too closely 
the hat from which the rabbit is pulled is dazzling. If from time to time I voice my fleeting suspicion that we may be collective victims of some stupendous self put on, if in a moment of particularly intense frustration or anguish, I am led to question the basic fabric of the Mayak plane, I find that the selves around me are instantly transformed into miraculous combinations of magicians, therapists. What cunning, what tenacity, what sleight of hand they display. At one or another such time, I may be advised either directly or through implication. Everyone has difficult periods these things have a way of straightening themselves out. Time heals all wounds. Things will look better next week. Have another martini or another joint. Find yourself a good analyst. Discover what your hangups are. How to better relate to people. How to get it all together. How to function as a meaningful member of society. See your clergyman, confess your sins, rid yourself of guilt, become a more spiritual person. Your sex life is inadequate. You need an exciting romance. Think positively. This makes you dynamic, forceful, optimistic, successful. Psychodrama helps work out hostility and depression. Why don't you go back to college? With a hairpiece, a new wardrobe, and the loss of 25 pounds, your self-image will really be enhanced. You'll be beautiful, desirable, glamorous, the envy of your friends, the life of every party. A better job will provide more security. You need a purpose in life. Learn to give of yourself and help people. Become involved in a meaningful crusade and it will all seem worthwhile. Love conquers all. You must learn how to love. Have you tried vitamin E, astrology, golf, exorcism, folk dancing, ESP, filmmaking? You may have natural abilities, hidden talents that you've never explored. How can I contest such wisdom? I am overwhelmed. The principle is very clearly conveyed to me. If I begin to suspect that the emperor is not really wearing any clothes at all, I must be hallucinating. If I entertain the notion that it is the inmates who are running the asylum, I am under some severe stress. Fortunately, there are things I can do to cure my afflictions. The above list represents only a small number of possibilities. I am once again persuaded, as I have been persuaded for as many times as there are grains of sand on the banks of the Ganges, that I simply have yet to find that proper course of action which will yield fulfillment. My faith renewed, my immobilization passed. I rejoin the conspiracy. I forge forward in quest of new horizons. The bluebird of happiness may be waiting just beyond any one of them. Chapter 2, Ordinary Mind, Keeper of the Keys. In Chapter 1, we described a fall or transformation from the original state of self to the mayic condition of my self. In the latter, I think of this self as being comprised of elements that include, one, a body with senses, Two, a mind with which emotions are somehow associated and that can abstract such things as a soul and a conscience. When I speak or think of myself, I have reference to all of these, but upon close observation, I detect that I do not consider the essence of myself to be equally present in all. For example, I view this essence as being in my body in only a limited way. I do not minimize the importance of my body, but I am consciously aware of this body in two fundamental ways, as it makes known its needs and as it is fitted to appear in the arena. 
Its needs are widely diverse and range from the desirability of having its teeth brushed to the act of procreation. The greater majority of these needs are, as time passes, met semi-automatically, frequently, almost unconsciously. Even in gratifying those which are of a more compelling or even sensual nature, such as hunger or the sexual urge, my mind can be preoccupied. Evidently, I am able to meet my physical needs with minimal involvement of the self, and I am left with the impression that only a modicum of myself is localized in my body and senses. Pain or discomfort can require my more continuous attention, but this does not alter my notion that the essence of myself is only partially in my body. I can become deeply involved in grooming my body, in adorning and shaping it to fulfill a manufactured image. And because this image continually changes, I can devote the better part of my entire life to such efforts, as do a great number of my fellow conspirators. In this case, I am very much aware of my body since it becomes the paramount consideration of my existence. But the fruits of these efforts, whatever they may be, are not realized by my body. A romantic conquest, winning a sports event, a claim for an artistic performance, compliments on my latest wardrobe or suntan provide small physical enjoyment. For although the body is the vehicle for such victories, the satisfaction is cerebral and emotional. It is my mind and my emotions that savor the triumphs. My body is simply in the arena. It is entered in events as a trainer enters his horse in various shows. The successes or failures that result from these events are experienced primarily by the trainer, mind, seldom by the horse, body. I can now understand that I really view my mind-body relationship in a peculiar manner. My mind is the repository of intelligence. Attached to it is a creature, an animal, a body that transports my mind and that my mind directs. Mind steers this body on numerous courses from which it hopes to derive varying degrees of pleasure and fulfillment. If because of some physical deformity or other negative condition or through the teachings of certain religions or philosophies, I become ambivalent to my body, I live all the more in my mind. So it is that when I reflect on the concept of myself as it relates to my body, I perceive one, that my physical needs can more frequently than not be satisfied almost unconsciously with what is apparently minimal self-involvement. Two, that those events in which my body plays the major role are nonetheless experienced primarily by my mind and emotions. My analysis therefore discloses that I identify the greater part of myself with my mind that I live principally in my mind, not in my body. I can understand how the situation has developed. Although I do appreciate the marvel of my physical organism, I am also acutely cognizant of its limitations. But my mind, what an incredible and unlimited instrument we have here. I can lose parts of my body, certain of its processes can be impaired, and it can even become immobile, but my mind will continue to function. Through mind, all things are possible. Whatever I seek to know and understand can be forthcoming from my mind. Utilizing those qualities ascribed to it, reason and logic, and with it, its ability to perceive, discriminate, interpret, and evaluate. It performs for me a multitude of indispensable and miraculous functions. All wonder that I and my fellow conspirators worship our individual and collective mind and are forever informing one another of its astounding accomplishments and infinite possibilities. The mind of man, we proclaim, what is beyond its capabilities. My reverence for mind is due in no small part, not only to how it directs my body, but to the service it performs with respect to desire, action, fulfillment. 
When my mind app apprehends my desires to evaluate them and advises me of the actions required for their fulfillment, and it has the ability to continually alter or modify its counsel in any degree necessary to aid me in dealing with changing situations and changing desires. Faithful and wondrous servant, if it errs, if it fails to provide me with a satisfactory solution to a particular problem or with what I regard as a fulfilling conclusion in a given situation, I am quick to forgive it. I recognize the numerous extenuating circumstances that are involved. It can hardly be held responsible for bad luck, unforeseen occurrences, or incomplete input. And immediately upon the heels of any ineptitude, it is able to revise, rectify, reevaluate. Additionally, it is e eternally ready to be improved and expanded. What more could one ask? No, despite what I interpret as an occasional failure, I feel completely justified in placing unqualified reliance upon my mind to cope with all circumstances in which I find myself. It is inconceivable that it would serve in any capacity other than which is ultimately in my best interest. After all, it is my mind, an indispensable part of me, it is at once my advisor, my friend, my confidant. I even spend many hours each day engaged in silent conversation with it, and I grow extre extremely uncomfortable when I imagine myself in a situation where its full faculties would not be available. The thought of mental disorders and abnormalities fills me with apprehension. How could I function without my mind? What would become of me? My existence without a fully operating mind is frightful to contemplate. All of these impressions contribute to my conviction that with several relatively insignificant exceptions, my mind is omnipotent. I grant it executive privilege. It can do little wrong. There is no need to question its allegiance to me or my dependence upon it. This view that we hold of our minds, this dependent way in which we relate to them, this essence of self which we invest them is established early in life and is reinforced on an almost second-to-second -second basis through the years. Early on, we accept mind and the way it appears to function in maintaining and fulfilling our lives as naturally as we accept our heartbeat. The necessity of questioning this acceptance is so remote that it has long ceased to occupy our consciousness. But now we are going to question our mind acceptance and it is urgent that the reader become consciously aware of the extent to which he has been an unaware par participant in this acceptance. It would therefore be highly meaningful for the reader to spend several minutes at this point in examining how he regards and relates to his mind. If he will do that now and refer to the above commentary as background material, he will probably conclude that this commentary expresses quite accurately the situation that obtains. This would be a revelation of paramount importance. Our fellow conspirators encourage us in the name of furthering the glorification of mind to investigate the magnificence of its functions and explore its limitless potential. In doing so, we are gainfully occupied and effectively diverted, for in the uncovering of endless wonders amid the splendors of a new virus and increasingly remote galaxies, who would commit the sacrilege of questioning the homage paid to this miraculous mind of man? To seriously undertake such an investigation would be to invite the greatest concern of our fellow mind worshippers, for they would perceive in this a threat of the first magnitude. The unquestioning trust that is placed in the ability of mind to ultimately interpret the most perplexing phenom phenomena of the universe, as well as to provide efficacious guidance in all situations, is one of the principal pillars of the Mayak structure and must stand firm at any cost. 
Consequently, any prospective defector suspected of chipping away, however lightly at these pillars, will feel the full weight of the conspiracy upon him. Ridicule, scorn, and even enforced therapy are but a few of the techniques utilized. Usually these are successful in discouraging the investigator. Only one who has experienced a profound awakening will persist. Without going into details, mention to those at the college you attend or at your favorite bar that you are questioning the ability of mind to offer valid guidance in the quest for fulfillment and note the generally disdainful reaction. Persist in this over a period of time and note the increasing hostility toward you of your companions. But proceeding under the premise that the reader may have been led to peruse this book because he has experienced an awakening, we will now incur the wrath of the Mayak agents by pursuing exactly such an investigation. And just as under a special type of examination, the concept of fulfillment through action was revealed to be an illusion responsible for continual frustration and suffering. So by subjecting our worship of mind and our identification of self with mind to scrutiny from what we shall term an extremaic perspective, we shall find that those truths which emerge reveal to us that the bond, that the mind is equally the perpetrator of our bondage. In my everyday life, I use the word mind to designate what I regard as a repository of certain essential components of myself, among which is a brain. I have no perception, no subjective or objective evidence whatsoever of a mind, but I do have objective evidence of a brain and I frequently use those two words interchangeably. Almost always when I speak of my mind, I am actually referring to my brain, to my computer. Although the word computer is relatively new in our common vocabulary, the brain has always functioned as a computer. The highly sophisticated computers currently in operation were, of course, devised by the brain and reflect but the tiniest fraction of its abilities. The brain is every bit as incredible as I have always believed. Indeed, it is so incredible that I fail to notice the power it has appropriated in the guise of serving me. A familiar theme in science fiction is that of the computer taking over. The brain takeover that has actually transpired within each individual in the Mayak state is the prototype of this plot. Having been devised to serve in the capacity of a servant, the brain has become the master. In its takeover, it has been abetted by cohorts, other elements that we attribute to mind. As we examine the phenomenon of this takeover, it is necessary that we make a very clear distinction between the mind that we conceive of as the brain together with attendant components and supreme intelligence or universal mind. We shall therefore apply the prefix ordinary to the former and designate it as ordinary mind. When I concluded that myself is more in my mind than in my body, I did indeed arrive at the correct conclusion, but I am correct in a way that is much different than I would have theorized. I discover that ordinary mind does a most remarkable thing. It manufactures and maintains the illusion of a self. This illusionary self that is referred to as I, me, myself, obscures my real self, my true I, as it exists in my original, pure, spotless, perfect state. It is obscured to the extent that I live the greater part of my life ignorant of it, of who I really am. This ignorance constituting the fall was previously described. One of the situations then that prevails in the Mayak state is this. It appears that there are two entities, myself and my mind. Having convinced me that these are separate and real, my ordinary mind proceeds to play endless games with the two concepts. A number of these were described in chapter one, and we should here restate the situation. 
Myself appears to be the representative of my existence. The components of this self, a body, emotions, a mind, must be protected from innumerable constant threats to which it is subject. Simultaneously, it must gratify its desires and fulfill its needs, whatever these are thought to be. This necessitates possessing, manipulating, and otherwise functioning among objects and conditions of what is interpreted to me as the world. Early in life, I am taught to believe that the component which presides over such matters is my mind or brain. Therefore, my fulfillment in life appears to be dependent to a very great extent on my mind. The more fulfillment and gratification I require, and as we have learned, desires and needs never cease, the more I rely on my mind. Soon, the dependence of myself on my mind is almost total, and the subsequent attitude of worship of the mind by the self is that which has been described above. In all of this, I fail to perceive that it is ordinary mind interacting with itself that produces the entire show. It is true that ordinary mind does contain a remarkable computer and other elements that enable me to undertake a vast range of activities and function with varying degrees of competence in the physical world. The point is that ordinary mind's abilities are confined within the limited dimension that it conceives. But it would have me believe that not for a minute is this the case, that in its noble search for meaning, it has the capacity to explore and comprehend the most sublime mysteries of the cosmos. It supports this contention with countless theories and sciences pertaining to fourth and fifth dimensions, parapsychology, psychic phenomena, extraterrestrial life, and it discusses heaven and hell, God and infinity with authority. But the reality is that ordinary mind can function only in terms of quantities and qualities. It perceives, discriminates, interprets, and advises according to input that it evaluates as logical. Illogical input is rejected. Even its abstractions must be derived from what it evaluates as logical input. With logical input, ordinary mind performs its functions and advises me of the readout. I interpret this readout as knowing and understanding. I say, I know or I don't understand such and such, but ordinary mind can know or not know only in terms of the above mentioned quantities and qualities. Consequently, it can only know about things. It can never know. It can never apprehend anything directly, totally, absolutely. Direct apprehension, total knowing requires the disillusion of the subject object relationship. There can be no duality of one who knows and a thing that is known. In knowing, the knower and the known are one. So while the ordinary mind may discourse endlessly and with great authority and brilliance in all matters, sacred and profane, this all remains perpetual speculation. Operating in the only manner it can in a subject-object relationship, Ordinary mind can purport to distinguish between fantasy and reality. It can discuss God, spirit, and soul, but it can know nothing of such things. When the second man, the deaf man, was advised by the master to find yourself, he interpreted this input as illogical. His ordinary mind dismissed it as being without relevance, without meaning. He heard, but he did not understand. The first man hearing the same words did not submit them to his ordinary mind for evaluation. He apprehended their meaning directly. He comprehended he knew what these words meant because he became one with their meaning. He was no longer a self subject attempting to apprehend meaning object. He understood that the situation was not one of an ordinary mind, the master's, attempting to convey an image to another ordinary mind, his own, but of self communicating with itself. 
If the foregoing sentences are submitted to your ordinary mind, if you must examine and find the logic of the words, you will be deaf, as was the second man. Only if you apprehend their meaning directly with universal mind can you understand them. Because a major objective of yoga practice is the attainment of direct apprehension, we shall examine the possibilities of this attainment in much greater detail subsequently. Shall we then dispense with the ordinary mind? Of course not. But we will attempt to view it from a transcendental perspective and realize that it is a temporary agent of the self. Ordinary mind is indispensable to our functioning in the physical world. It provides us with the many necess necessary facts and statistics that we must have to navigate physically, mentally, and emotionally among the objects and conditions of the world. If we allow ordinary mind to appropriate endless power to take over, to lead us down the garden path and convince us over and over again that it has the capacity to provide ultimate fulfillment we shall never cease to suffer. When I turn to ordinary mind for counsel in attaining fulfillment, I make a very grave error. I am seeking security and peace, and I continually turn for instruction in attaining these to an entity that creates a dimension of subjects and objects of illusionary opposites that maintain for me the constant awareness of insecurity and turmoil. The situation is somewhat akin to asking the fox to guard the, the chickens. The cry of this generation is do your own thing, but it is the ordinary mind that pre presents the images of what this thing and what this self should be. Ordinary mind has no more knowledge of the self than a single cell has knowledge of the entire organism. One of the most profound deceptions of the ordinary mind is its illusion of problem solving. A significant part of our worship of mind is based on its ability to solve or at least cope with a multitude of problems, large and small, with which we are continually beset. Mind, valiant and capable ally, evaluates our problems and implements the procedures necessary to resolve them. It can deal with many different types of problems simultaneously. Since hardly an hour passes during which I do not experience one or more problems, it is obvious to me that this is another indispensable capacity in which my mind serves. But let us look more closely at this problem-solving process. From where do the problems come? I envision them as arising from some source that is external and alien. I have the general impression that people, conditions, and events create a situation wittingly or unwittingly, that results in my having a problem. The magnitude of this problem is not important here. The problem is apprehended by my mind and the problem-solving pr procedure is initiated. In the course of my everyday life, it is inconceivable to me that my problems do not arise from outside myself. It is unthinkable that the entity that is called upon to cope with and hopefully solve the problem my mind is the very entity that creates the problem. And yet, under scrutiny from our extramaic perspective, this is exactly what we discover. We realize that there are no outside problems. The world and nature create not a single perplexity. My ordinary mind creates them. This is indeed a starting re startling realization because, as previously stated, we cannot imagine any situation in which our minds, our friends, servants, and advisors in whom we place unqualified trust would not act in our best interests. Why would my mind deceive me? Why would it create problems with which to frustrate and torment me? The truth is that the computer aspect of my ordinary mind could not care less about my frustrations and sufferings. It may convince me that it has allied itself with my emotions in such a way that it seeks to promote my experience of those which are positive and minimize my experience of those which are negative. But this is not the reality of the situation. 
The manner in which the ordinary mind functions entails its dealing with quantities, qualities, facts, statistics. How naive of us to believe that it is a problem solver and not a problem creator. The situation is similar to our believing that we shall somehow be able to realize happiness without despair and success without failure. It is the ordinary mind that creates our problems and then, as it elects, goes about coping with or solving these problems, all the while programming a host of new problems. Our delusion is that the problems originate somewhere outside of us through the ingenuity and resourcefulness of the mind, the problems will be resolved. Occasionally, we are even led to envision a time when there will be no more problems, but existence in Maya is synonymous with endless problems. The ordinary mind computer has a problem manufacturer built in. Just as there is no end to desires, so there is no end to problems. They are eternal. Two other intriguing aspects of the Mayak structure are the illusions of name and time. The written and spoken word has great power. The reality of the world of objects, conditions, and ordinary mind concepts, all changing, all illusionary, is reinforced each time such things are named. We come to believe that when we are able to name an object, person, or condition, we somehow know and experience it. But it is this very naming which largely is responsible for creating and reinforcing the subject-object relationship. As long as it appears to me that I, subject, am looking at the flower, object, I am prevented from truly knowing and experiencing the flower. We shall have a direct understanding of this later. Also, a basic component in the Mayak structure, the element of time, is programmed into virtually all functions of the ordinary mind computer. Consequently, we find it almost impossible to think in terms that do not include the time dimension. Time, past, present, future, imparts a formidable reality to all objects and conditions of Maya. We apprehend changes in objects and conditions, and changes appear to transpire in a continuum, a sequence that we designate as time. Time is an especially potent reinforcer of the value of action, for we are taught to accept the proposition, in time, everything comes to he who perseveres, whatever the forms that his perseverance is supposed to take with certain other aspects of Maya that are manufactured by ordinary mind, time is an important convenience for Mayak arrangements, but it is a convenience that turns into a destructive monster when it exerts such influence upon us that we become its slaves. Birth and death, growth and decay, sunrise and sunset, and the change of the seasons would appear to lend indisputable reality to time, but self is eternal. Eternal is not something that is born and lives a very long time. Eternal means no birth, no death, no beginning, no end. It simply is. What is eternal is timeless. While the illusion of time reinforces the promise of the conspiracy that what we do not now have, we shall someday have, the diversionary opiate of hope, the truth of the matter is that because self is eternal, it exists only now and can never exist in any place and at any time other than now. Now is not to be equated with the present. As a component of the past, present, future sequence, now is now, now is all. Now is without the qualities of time. There has never been a past in which self was in any way incomplete and there will never be a future in which it will become complete. But this truth is contrary to all perceptions of ordinary mind and to all tenets of the Mayak conspiracy. It is illogical in the extreme, and my fellow conspirators want no part in it. They would have me believe that timelessness is a curious novel conception 
that may be of interest to theologians, philosophers, and far out physicists, but has no practical relevance to everyday living, to you and me. Contrary, it has the greatest possible relevance because as long as I do not comprehend that I can exist only now, I believe the promise that my fulfillment lies in an illusionary future, providing that I undertake the proper courses of action. Of such courses of action, we have noted there are no end. The future never comes. The past never was. These are manufactured conveniences to facilitate the manipulation of my conditions. If we make an effort to become very quiet in our bodies and to stop our thoughts for a few moments, we may have an inkling that awareness is occurring now. Have we ever been aware at any time in any dimension other than now? The ordinary mind computer can spew forth all of the facts that comprise a past but you can be aware of these facts only now. The ordinary mind computer can summon data from which it projects a future, but are we aware of this future, in the future, or now? We do not exist in time, we exist only as self. To exist as self now implies utilizing the time component as is necessary on the Mayak plane but not as reality that ensnares us in endless actions to achieve fulfillment in an imaginary future. We are now complete, perfect, and at peace. Self-realization is the experiencing of these truths, not in an illusionary past or future, but now. If we do not have this realization now, we can never have it. Let us return to our examination of the self I use the word self not only to designate a composite of subjective and objective aspects of my existence, body, senses, emotions, actions, mind, but in reference to an entity that I conceive has some type of form and substance that is in some way real. I may acknowledge its elusiveness, but I never question its existence. I identify myself with my existence. They appear to be one. After all, could I exist without myself? Yes, I can and I do. And it is imperative that I have some insight into this truth, for such an insight will assist me in unlocking one of the stoutest doors of the Mayak prison. Although I have accepted myself as synonymous with my existence and have had little reason to question its reality, I decide one day to examine this self I will look at it carefully and attempt to determine all I can about its nature. But regardless of the point at which I begin my investigation, regardless of how many different paths I pursue and how far out or far in I travel, regardless of how simple, complex, subtle, or gross are my investigative techniques, I eventually arrive at only one conclusion. There is no self, no me to examine. And I is nowhere to be grasped. I come to realize that my investigation is only ordinary mind investigating itself. I have no self without my mind. I have no separate self, no I, apart from the one that is manufactured and sustained by ordinary mind. What a fantastic game ordinary mind plays. It creates the impression of a self and then proceeds to go in search of it so that it can be examined. I know myself only as ordinary mind permits me to know myself. I know that I am I only when I think about I and then only to the extent that ordinary mind provides the pertinent thoughts that it labels me. Each time I must identify or re-identify myself, I am actually manufactured anew. I call upon my mind to furnish the identifying series of statistics. The brain, the ultimate computer, is able in the smallest fraction of a second to provide a multitude of such statistics, thought forms that succeed one another with incalculable rapidity that have been recorded and stored in its banks. Instantaneously, I am presented with my name, address, age, physical characteristics, affiliations, 
relationships, likes, dislikes, ambitions, and whatever else is required in a particular situation to reestablish or reinforce the I. Accompanying emotions are likewise evoked as necessary. Therefore, I exist in relation to the statistics or thoughts that I have about myself and only in relation to these thoughts. But the machinations of ordinary mind are even more extensive. It does not limit its construction to a single I. Any number of I's are manufactured. At one end of the I spectrum, there is my super good I, possessing all the qualities that are regarded as virtuous and desirable. At the other end, there is the abysmally bad I to which are attributed the opposite objectionable qualities. In between, there are all degrees of good and bad I's. The identities, statistics of each can be summoned forth in a split second. I like to identify with the good eyes that will, through a ver variety of high principled undertakings, eventually transform the bad eyes into good eyes. Since I am continually informed by my fellow conspirators that the transformation of bad into good is highly commendable, it is sometimes known as self-improvement. I can easily make this a lifelong activity. It is an utterly futile one. Good, no matter how it is conceived, is eternally the other end of bad. I recognize good only as it is relative to bad. Therefore, in order to manifest a virtuous, moral, constructive, good self, my unvirtuous, immoral, destructive, bad self must remain alive and well. But being largely ignorant of this, I continue to function as though self-improvement is a desirable and attainable objective. The manner in which ordinary mind undertakes this self-improvement process is fascinating. For example, when I say I must lose 25 pounds, I am envisioning a bad I, a treacherous scoundrel who, weak and undisciplined, has through its uncontrolled appetites added 25 excessive pounds to my physical eye. My good eye with whom I am now identifying understands that these extra 25 pounds are undesirable. My physical eye has conveyed this fact to my good eye through the negative overloaded way it feels. Additionally, my good eye has reached this conclusion through its intellect, through facts about the dangers of excessive weight that have come to its attention. At this point, my good eye loathes my bad eye and my physical eye, holding them responsible for the dreadful overweight condition. It knows that it must now confront my bad eye, convince it that it must alter its degenerate ways, stop it from seducing my physical eye into additional pounds, and in general, assist my good eye in a weight loss program. What we have here then is three eyes. There is the physical eye, he's the dumb one, all he does is the eating. My bad eye, he's the seducer of unsuspecting physical eyes. He encourages them to eat themselves into oblivion. And my good eye, the noble, clear-thinking eye who must rescue my physical eye from the clutches of my bad eye. My good eye considers various approaches to my bad eye, ranging from logic and reason to harsh discipline. Accordingly, certain measures are implemented. What they are is unimportant. But when lunchtime arrives, I eat six donuts and a hot fudge sundae. What happened? Well, I decided that I will begin my diet tomorrow morning and that I am entitled to just one more good time, which I is it that has made this decision. What dialogue developed among the three eyes? Did my bad eye whine, plead, threaten, exhort? Did my good eye conclude that a compromise was the best course? Were the donut and Sunday needs of my physical eye simply overpowering? Did I somehow switch my sympathies and identify with my bad eye, casting my good eye to the winds? Again, the answers are unimportant here, but what is extremely revealing is how these 
I dynamics manifest how they are involved in much of our thinking and action. Eyes are manufactured by ordinary mind, invested with identities that make them appear real and set to playing endless games with one another. Our everyday phrases attest to our unquestioning acceptance of this self-plurality. One hears expressions such as, I have decided to improve myself. Here we have an I who has decided that there is another I, myself, that needs to be improved. The first eye is going to work on the second eye as a sculptor molds a piece of clay until the second eye is improved and who will make the determination that the project is proceeding satisfactorily, that the first eye is correctly improving the second eye? Why, an unpartial observer, a third eye, of course. Unfortunately, we find this observer, this third eye, frequently slipping from its position of, of objectivity and taking an active voice in informing the first eye of its inadequacies in improving the second eye. A current popular expression enjoins us to get it all together. In this case, there is a principal self who perceives that an unknown number of additional selves, its charges, have gone astray, become strung out. This principal I is therefore proposing that the dispersed selves be brought, brought back into the fold, united with one another and with itself, the principal self. Whatever course is followed to achieve this absurd objective, the task will prove extremely trying for each rebellious self that is returned to wherever the principal self envisions it is supposed to be. The holes in the fence permit several additional dissident selves to escape. The person who is involved in getting it all together never gets it all together. The best he can hope for is brief moments of respite between escapes. Or we hear, I think I am going out of my mind. How many selves do we count in this bizarre declaration? Now there is one, and I who thinks about number two, who, and I who is going three out of a mind that must be in the possession of yet another I, my. And who is it that is able to observe and analyze all this that is transpiring among the three eyes? Why, a fourth eye. And it follows that only a fifth eye could be taking note of the existence of these other four eyes and so on into infinity. Amidst all of these eyes, is there one that is more genuinely my true I? If so, will the real I, the real self, please stand up? The real self will stand up splendidly indeed. It has never sat down, but it cannot be found in the Mayak condition. The numerous I's, me's, and you's are thoughts and concepts of the ordinary mind. Try as we may, we shall find not a trace of a self to get a grip on or to improve. Wait just a moment, protests the reader. I see myself. I feel myself. I am conscious of myself. Are you really telling me that I do not exist? Exactly so. The to does not exist in the real, ultimate, absolute sense that is totally pertinent to our everyday lives. And what a supremely joyous revelation this is, since it grants instantaneous relief from the burden of caring with all of one's energies for an illusionary I. You do see a physical body, but not a self. You are conscience, conscious, you are but not of a self. The self, the source of delusion and suffering, appears only when ordinary mind manufactures it. The existence of the self is the concept of the self. The innumerable eyes have no reality. They arise and disappear only as thoughts, thoughts succeeding one another. Such incalculable rapidity that the illusion of a simultaneity <laughs> there can only be one thought, only one manufactured at any given moment. When the thought is gone, the I is gone. 
This can be confirmed by consciously interrupting the flow of thoughts by literally turning them off. Ordinarily, as we indicated earlier, my thoughts are incessant and irrepressible. On a perpetual basis, they succeed one another with great force and rapidity. Although I have no knowledge of how and from where they arise and to where they go when I am no longer aware of them, the term waves, impulses, subconscious, etc. Objective des designations of men of science and in no way explain the nature of thoughts as I actually experience them. They appear to be my thoughts occurring in my mind and requiring my attention. This incessant procession of thoughts, I regard it as natural, as the process of thinking. It does not register with me that ordinary mind, in order to maintain its complete dominance, deems it essential that my attention be fully and permanently occupied with thoughts. So the brain, the thinking machine, the computer that is meant to serve by furnishing information relevant to specific situations, grossly exceeds its intended function and takes over. Unremittingly, the thoughts come and go, their endless modifications come and go, come and go again and again, and regardless of their nature, no matter how preposterous and enslaving they may be, I am committed to devote my energies to each. We must again note here that I have no perception whatsoever of a mind. I am aware only of a thought and impression. I assume that this thought and those that precede and follow it are passing through a mind, somewhat as a train travels through a tunnel. This thought process is so firmly established, so automatic, that the direction, turn off your thoughts, is evaluated by ordinary mind as illogical input. Why? It asks incredulously, should I want to stop the thoughts when it is the process of thinking that makes everything possible? Ordinary mind fiercely resists this illogical suspension of thoughts, which it is really interpreting as an extraordinary threat and makes it extremely difficult to execute. Consequently, Concerted effort is required to interrupt the thinking process for even the briefest interval. But if I succeed, there is no more I. There is consciousness, but it is not self-consciousness. There is awareness, but it is not awareness being perceived by an I. It is awareness only. Awareness alone. Awareness. This is not to be confused with nothingness. It is a profound state, transcending maya, that manifests when it is unobscured by ordinary mind, by thinking. It is the approach to our real state. We shall have much to say of it subsequently, but at this point it would be meaningful for the reader to attempt the application of the thought suspension practice. Position and remaining quiet and relaxed for several minutes without external distractions, he should determine what occurs if he is successful in turning off his thoughts. There are no special techniques required, no secret knowledge to be applied, and no specific results to be sought. It is simply a matter of attempting to experience a brief interval of awareness of consciousness without thought. Such an experience point. Abruptly terminated. Ordinary mind ascended for even a moment, burst upon one's quietude with a raging torrent of thoughts that cannot be restrained. The I is recreated, the Mayak condition is reestablished made careful note of this threatening transgression. It will be certain to you source to prevent this practice from being undertaken again. The devices that it employs this end are well known to every beginning student of meditation. The reader will have noted certain obvious ambiguities that are involved in this chapter. The fundamental ambiguities, those that pervade the entire discussion, may be expressed as follows. 
by the very proposition ordinary mind. That is, when I, the author, write about ordinary mind, is it not my ordinary mind that is formulating the thoughts with which to convey this information? You, the reader, in following these thoughts, gain an insight into the nature of ordinary mind. Is this not ordinary mind? Is ordinary mind not a closed circle, an entity that can give the impression of getting one up on itself, but always remains ordinary mind, even in its own one-upmanship? And if I realize the value of transcending ordinary mind, of seeking my real self, is it not ordinary mind that has arrived at this conclusion? If the nature of ordinary mind is as described in this chapter, why and how would it reach the conclusion to transcend itself? In response, master and his two listeners, by virtue of being a master, enlightened man, his words issue forth from the self. These words are directed to the self contained within the two listeners. The ordinary mind of the second man, the deaf man, is a closed circle, so completely closed and obscuring self to such an extent that the light of is unable to penetrate. The light rebounds, diffuses, the words are meaningless. But the ordinary mind of the first man has a gap in its enclosure, a chink in its armor. The nature of this aperture and why it would exist in the first man and not in the second will concern us in the next chapter. But the fact that it is there permits the light of the words, their extramaic meaning to penetrate, to pass through and awaken the sympathetic vibrations of the self at which they were directed. The master utilizes words as a tool of the ordinary mind to convey self to self. Words constantly inadequate medium through which to communicate the nature of self. Their inadequacy for the ambiguities with which this discussion is permeated. Words are the product of ordinary entity we are attempting to place in a wholly different perspective and impose the limitations and distortions of their creator. In the above sense, there are not two selves, an object self and the subject self. But the self to self phrase was used because it is more intelligible and at this stage of the study we are involved in an intricate delicate process since we must obviously engage the attention of the ordinary mind we will cater to it by programming at least partial logical input while simultaneously seeking to transcend it. It is in this context that we are employing concepts and techniques that appear to originate in ordinary mind and to be directed to ordinary mind. Actually, they are being used to transcend dentally. They originate in and are directed to self. The entire preceding discourse on self, desire, action, etc is designed to confound ordinary mind by appealing to it through its own agents, investigation, analysis, and dialectics. In consciously turning ordinary mind upon itself through serious examination of our self delusion, we cause continue to question the nature of ordinary mind, even though it appears to be ordinary mind that is doing the questioning the greater the possibility of placing it ultimately in the position that it is meant to occupy, and the more hopeful the prospect of being extricated from those entanglements of it that would hold us a perpetual prisoner, breaches in its structure the entire house of cards that it has manufactured falls. Universal mind self remains. I don't know if I want that to happen, declares the reader. What will become of me if the structure should disintegrate? In response to this, we must ask, who is expressing the anxiety? 
The self has no fear. It is ordinary mind that is concerned about the I it maintains. It is ordinary mind creating the fiction that something will be lost, that one's worst fears of annihilation will be realized should it cease to occupy its place of unquestioned dominance. Another self-preservation question takes the form of a peculiar concern for one's prison. What would become of society if everybody wanted to transcend his ordinary mind? Imagine a man who awakens to find his apartment house on fire and those who reside in it suffocating men respond and provide a rescue net rather than jump into the, this net the man with flames looking at him from all sides elects to engage in a debate with his would-be rescuers as to the fate of the burning house if all within should escape returning to the problem of ambiguity our attempt to transcend ordinary mind has not been confined to analysis we have taken direct action, or more properly, non-action, toward this end. <clears throat> when we sat quietly for a brief interval and turned off our thoughts, we experienced no sense of loss or fear. If anything, the sensation was one of having found or rediscovered a dimension of our existence, of which we are usually ignorant. We have barely touched on this state of self, and there are no other conclusions that we shall draw at this point. We refer to that technique of turning off the thoughts again here because it enables us, if we so choose, to simply dismiss whatever ambiguities may improve inhibiting and conduct a direct approach to the transcending of order. The response then to the ambiguity encountered in this presentation is twofold. One, ambiguity, contradiction, duplexity will work to our advantage as described above. Two, it can be disregarded when it proves excessively troublesome and various practices can be undertaken that provide direct experience of the indicated objectives. Now the material of these first two chapters is concerned primarily with the presentation of a perspective of life as it is experienced in Maya. Additionally, there have been inferences that it is possible to achieve liberation from the Mayic bonds. But before pursuing the implications of liberation, it will be well for us to review the situation to summarize those conditions that we experience from moment to moment on we exist in a dimension of constant threat and danger. We are beset on all sides by endless problems that, in our delusion, we attempt to resolve with the very entity that creates them. We seek and but cannot because we are eternally separated in a subject-object relationship from that which we would know. Through a universal conspiracy, we accept these situations as a natural course of events, as life. Hypnotized by the self-appropriated authority of ordinary mind, immersed in believing in not only one but many selves that ordinary mind manufactures and maintains, we subscribe unquestioningly to its elusive propositions. Among these fantasies, Desire action fulfillment convinces us that it is natural and necessary to strive for happiness, success, pleasure, and security. That such elusive objects are achieved through the right kind of action and that somehow our achievements can be made permanent. Thus, dutifully complying with the party line of the conspiracy, we spend our lives experiencing incessant desires that compel us to undertake the incessant actions dictate fulfillment. But because our desires are interminable, interminable, because our actions can never truly satisfy these desires, and because we seek what is ultimate and permanent in a state where only constant impermanence and fluctuation obtain, we suffer. We suffer not only throughout this lifetime, but throughout an infinite number of lifetimes. How shall we escape from this prison of Maya? 
When shall we awaken from those illusions that promote perpetual anxiety and experience the only reality wherein peace and fulfillment lie, the self? Chapter 3, Disillusionment, Exposing the Conspiracy more than anything, it is paradoxically sheer weariness that causes the ignorant, deaf, sleeping being to awaken. At some point, after innumerable lifetimes of suffering, of countless actions undertaken in a fruitless quest for fulfillment, the sleeping being experiences an event that acts as the final straw. Whatever this event may be, and it may be anything, it acts as the precipitating cause of his questioning the promises of fulfillment that have been eternally held out to him by the conspirators. He begins to mistrust the ways that he has been told he must follow for the attainment of security and peace. Thus, a pinhole of light appears in the curtain. The sleeping man begins to stir. Continued questioning results in greater unrest that intensifies and accelerates the awakening process. The initial stages of awakening frequently generate a profound conflict. The awakened being functions in a condition in which he is still largely subject to the dominance of ordinary mind and governed by the principles of the conspiracy, but in which there is a partial cognition of self. The resultant turbulence of being subject to two forces of existing simultaneously in what is experienced as two very different dimensions usually makes for a difficult period. Having once awakened, a man may intermittently nap, but he cannot return to his undisturbed. Deep stirrings, welcome or unwelcome, will continue to prod this man so that he is literally pushed and pulled into an ever-widening recognition of the conspiracy, of the illusion. An expression of this conflict can be found throughout the scriptures of both East and West. Jacob, Moses, David, John of the Cross are familiar examples of those who articulated their distress in this situation. The awakened man eventually understands that he is in the position of a traveler plodding along a path that is perceived only as through a dark glass. He trudges obstacles and confused by incessant adversities. He may briefly rest, he may even reverse his direction temporarily, but ultimately he is committed to resume his forward movement. Although he has a sense of destination and may, if the light is just right, catch an occasional view of the road ahead, his vision is largely Sooner or later, it becomes evident that the services of a guide are required. The guru is the guide on the path. Many paths lead to the self. All have their respective gurus. Each age, each culture has developed systems of self-realization. The most cursory perusal of philosophy and metaphysics discloses numerous such systems. When an individual should be attracted to a and elect to traverse one path in preference to another is a matter of inclination, of tendency, of natural and of the teacher, the guru. They are not opposed or even contradictory to one another. They simply approach the cognition of self from different vantage points. Of these schools, the two that are acknowledged to treat self-realization in the most comprehensive manner are Vedanta, the end of wisdom, the nature and state of self, and yoga, those techniques that enable the seeker to attain direct experience of the self. This book is concerned primarily with yoga. The many paths that have developed as variations of the major systems of self-realization, and it is interesting to note that self-realization means literally self-real, all have their gurus. 
The word guru has become very popular in the Western world, and while little less than a decade ago, a guru evoked a most alien image, some strange, scantily clothed fakir, ready to hypnotize the unsuspecting Westerner, subject him to degenerate pagan rituals, and rob him of his reason and possessions. It is suddenly very in, very fashionable to speak about gurus. Consequently, the term is being applied not only to a large number of people who have anything to say about philosophy and metaphysics, but has also been extended to include a multitude of teachers in all subjects, artists, writers, musicians, and even entertainers, professional sportsmen, and drug pushers. It is startling and tragic to hear an interview with a drug addict in which he describes how he was initially turned on by his LSD guru. This may be the ultimate example of a misnomer in the history of language. While the, Eastern term, while the term guru has been used in the East, particularly India, to denote respect for one's spiritual teacher, regardless of the teacher's attainments in the most venerable of the yoga shastras or scriptures, a guru denotes either a totally enlightened or a highly evolved who in one form or another imparts instruction and guidance. In this book, guru is used only in the latter context. We do not apply the term guard poets to the yoga teacher at the local YWCA who may be two chapters ahead of her in the textbook or to most of the visiting competing with one another to determine which can establish the most branch offices or the most ashrams the quickest. Many of these Indians may have something to say that deserves attention and consideration they are not gurus, dispellers of ignorance in the classical sense. True guru is a disillusioner. Throughout the ages, he has blown the whistle on the conspiracy. He has explained the nature of Maya. Different periods, cultures, and attitudes require different types of whistles and different methods of blowing them. But essentially, gurus address themselves to those in the society. Whatever their stations, who have developed ears here, who have awakened, who seek guidance on the path. The teachings and texts take many forms, ranging from the doctrine of love and humility as espoused by Jesus, to the slap in the face by the Zen Roshi, to being shown how to get out of your own way and let things function naturally, the path of the Taoist, the application of breath control and asanas that comprise the system of hatha yoga. The following is the essence of what is transmitted by the guru of the path with which this book is concerned. Brahma is all. There is none other. Self is pure, spotless, unconditioned, infinite, eternal, and trans Hence, it is real. Fulfillment lies in the uncovering and recognition of self. A man, woman, suffers without end as long as he or she lives in ignorance of self. This ignorance is equated with the state of maya, illusion. Unreal. In his ignorance, man identifies with body, senses, and mind, and attaches himself to the things and conditions of the world, attempting to possess, manipulate, and function among them in ways that will result in his happiness and fulfillment. As a consequence, he is confined to an existence of subject-object relationships that appear to transpire in a dimension of time. In his ignorance, man falls under the spell of his servant, the usurper, ordinary mind. Ordinary mind manufactures multitudinal eyes whose appetites require endless gratification. Consequently, interminable action 
satisfy the desires of the manufactured eyes. Five, act that is obscured by the incessant activity of the faculties of ordinary mind to self. Above context, the function of the guru becomes twofold. One, he exposes the conspiracy that prevails on the mayak plane by revealing the nature of ordinary mind. And two, according to the yoga that is involved, he provides the techniques and guidance that lead to the self. These are on different levels as long as the guru-disciple relationship is in effect but it is a relationship that requires the most delicate judgment on the part of the guru. For in its course, the student comes to regard his guru with great reverence, and it is not unusual that this reverence develops into a type of fanatical worship. All the while, the guru is aware of a most vital and profound He, the guru, cannot impart enlightenment or liberation. He can only point the way. The real giver of wisdom, the one who truly enlightens, is the guru within. The art of the guru lies in pushing the disciple from without so that the guru may pull from within. The fact that the truth is within is a most difficult one to convey to the disciple, especially in his initial stages of awakening. He is inclined to view the external physical guru as the repository of all of the virtues and miraculous powers that his romantic fantasy can impute. But the guru knows better. He may accept the position of awe in which he is held, but only if he can employ it as a device to convey that what the disciple is doing in using him, the guru, as the object of worship, is externalizing self and projecting the guru within onto the physical form of the guru. Oh, as often as the disciple would seek wisdom, fulfillment, and peace with his ordinary mind, that is, in the world of objects, people, and conditions, the guru will turn him back objectives within, rather than attempting to establish a protracted guru-disciple relationship. It is the guru's function to have the disciple realize in the shortest possible time that the guru is within and that he, the physical guru, is extraneous, that indeed he can actually re represent an obstacle to the disciple's liberation. It must be reiterated that in all of this, we are using the term guru in its classical context, denoting either a fully self-realized being or one who is highly evolved. The fact is, however, that relative to the world population, there is a very small number of such fully realized beings. Of these, only a fraction at the capacity of a guru who undertakes the direct instruction of students. And of these, the number of true gurus of yoga who have journeyed to the Western world are very, very few. Therefore, the situation currently prevailing is that an awakening man who is attracted to one of the paths of yoga may find a teacher who is able to convey to him in an adequate manner the principles of that path. But the possibility of this man finding a yoga guru in the classical meaning of the word is exceedingly remote. This holds true not only in the countries of the Western world, but in India as well. The difficulty is compounded when one understands that even having encountered a being who is ostensibly a true guru, the seeker cannot know whether this being will be his guru. A relationship of the most subtle nature, usually extending over a significant period of time, must be established between the teacher and the student before each can determine if the teacher is the true guru for this particular disciple. We noted above that only a fraction of the self-realized beings undertake to act in the capacity of gurus. An uninformed reader, this information is often puzzling. Why, he wonders, are beings making this world a better place in which to live? 
jointly and widely with all mankind and by personally instructing the greatest possible number of interested students. This person does not understand the purpose and function of the guru, nor does he comprehend those methods through which wisdom is conveyed. Even the awakened man still largely dominated by the ordinary mind and still believing that fulfillment is somehow connected to the plane of objects and conditions is frequently inclined to envision the guru as a type of social or political figure. One who is concerned with resolving worldly problems and bettering living conditions. Such worldly improvements may result from the teachings of certain gurus, but they must be understood as byproducts of these teachings. Gurus are not concerned with increasing the disciple's odds for getting what he thinks he wants out of life. True gurus are uncompromising liberators. The ordinary mind can seldom countenance or comprehend their transcendental teachings. A student who undertakes the practice of yoga in the hope that this practice will improve his lot in life is not yet ready for yoga. The Western world is currently in the throes of guru mania. The demand for gurus is producing, among other phenomena, bizarre self-styled, self-proclaimed gurus, as well as numerous visitors from India whose motives and guru abilities should be closely examined by potential disciples. The author has personal knowledge of hundreds of seekers who are dissipating their precious life force by running from one teacher to another, from one retreat or ashram to another, from one state or country to another, hoping to encounter a guru. Some of these seekers are involved in a genuine quest for instruction. Many are looking for a being of Superman, someone who will turn them on, bend their minds, send them on a far out trip or impart enlightenment with a magic gesture, mantra or ritual. All are subject to the guru myth. But the fact that there is this driving desire to discover an external guru contains an essential implication. The seeker presupposes that there is knowledge and wisdom to be acquired that he does not possess. Such is not the case. The seeker does now and always possess what he believes he is in quest of. And as we have stated, the guru's function is to turn the disciple into himself so that he, the disciple, comes to know with the deepest possible con conviction that his guidance on the path unfolds from within. If instead of expanding the vast amounts of effort and time in what is generally an unproductive search for the external guru, the awakening man and all those who seek guidance would understand that such guidance must be sought within themselves. They would soon find that they are indeed being instructed by the only guru, the internal guru that the possibility of encountering a true guru is exceedingly remote, and moreover, that such an encounter must not be considered as essential. The position that should be taken by those in the Western world who are attracted to yoga and are in some degree engaged in yogic practices is that at some point in their studies, a guru embodied in a physical form may appear but that it is actually of no consequence whether he does or does not. The most sublime wisdom that he imparts will be pale in comparison with that which is continually available from the ultimate guru within. How does the student evoke this internal instruction? We have noted that it is the function of the external guru to push so that the guru may pull. The physical guru utilizes various methods, some of which have been outlined above, to implement the push. And techniques of this book and other similar sources of instruction to which the student may be attracted attempt to provide the same catalytic action. Each time the yoga techniques presented herein are seriously applied by the student, they push him within, they open him more and more to the illumination of the guru.
Once guides from within, the student learns how to listen for this guidance. His listening is done ear that gradually becomes attuned and sensitive to the inner voice. In the initial stages, the catalyst, the push, is implemented and the guidance received primarily during practice sessions. These sessions may consist of the application of prescribed techniques such as asanas, pranayama, mantra, push, and the guidance is received during regulated periods of meditation. At times, the instruction is readily available. At times, it is slow in coming, but the student understands it will be forthcoming. The form that the inner instruction takes cannot be articulated. It is subtle, sublime, and transcends altogether that knowledge which is sought by ordinary mind. Thing ...of an entirely different type, not of the transient, but of the eternal. As the inner voice continues to be heard, the student becomes increasingly self-reliant. He seeks less and less direction from people and conditions of the world, the world that is interpreted to him by ordinary mind and the senses. The Mayak conspiracy, ingeniously camouflaged during innumerable lifetimes, the guru almost at will, and ultimately he perceives that he is receiving guidance not only during practice sessions, but continually, every moment, regardless of where he is or what he is doing. The guru pulls and guides the disciple to self. When the self of the disciple merges with self, when yoga or reintegration is achieved, the guru is no more. Without leaving his house, one can know everything that is necessary. One can grasp all wisdom. Lao Tzu.